Welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be talking about the next step today. Sorry that things didn't work out last time. This is take two of the next step, but I think I got things squared Welcome away back. and working this time. I'm hoping and praying that it's going to work um, and uh, that we can get the full lecture in. I just Welcome saw back. that YouTube... Everyone. And Rocky just commented on my Facebook page and mentioned that YouTube has posted the video from last time. They did, um, <clears throat> but of course it's not the full presentation. I, I got an email, for those of you that didn't hear the story, I got an email after the la last uh, live session uh, stopped. And um, it was because my computer died. I was in my car my computer died but then I got it powered back up and then I got a um, message that the video wouldn't start again the stream and so I checked my emails shortly thereafter and saw an email saying I violated the community um, uh, policy for um, YouTube and I wasn't sure why but I think the reason is because I was about to show a video and I don't think they like you showing other YouTube videos in your YouTube video. So I took that out this time. So hopefully I won't have any issues this time. And I'm also pre-streaming. So um, I'm actually recording this video beforehand and then I'll be on with you guys uh, and I can answer your questions in the chat. And so feel free, this is for you. And so feel free to ask questions during the presentation, any questions you might have. Um, I should mention too, I know I've mentioned it here and there, but um, I never really formally introduced myself. Uh, my name is Joshua Fleming. I'm a fourth year medical student in West Virginia, and um, I have a master's degree in exercise science, so I have an interest in nutrition and exercise. I always have. Um, and right now, I just uh, a couple weeks ago got into a residency in family medicine and Texas, so I'll be going down to Harlingen, Texas <clears throat> for residency in family medicine. And I plan to practice family medicine and um, hopefully practice the principles of uh, lifestyle medicine um, as well and possibly get a fellowship in lifestyle medicine. But we'll see uh, what happens. And uh, regardless of that, I'll be sharing the principles of lifestyle medicine. I plan to be for my whole career. Um, but uh, these things being said, I should say that the things that I'm saying don't reflect the opinions of any uh, my school or any organization. It's just something I'm personally put together, research that I've done personally um, with the help of others uh, as well, mentors and people that I've spoken with. Um, and I'll make mention of them as well um, if I use their material. Um, but all the citations are in the PowerPoint, and if there's any questions you had, like I said, just ask me. Again, the purpose of these videos is um, kind of twofold. For one, it's I started them in West Virginia at a on-site location and invited the community and patients that I saw in the clinic during my clinical rotations that I invited to come, um, and it was just a volunteer project I did doing was doing in the community but since coronavirus came about i wasn't able to use a library because they closed it of course um, for social distancing purposes and so um, i figured it might be a good idea to uh, do them and continue them online so i just restarted them online and here we are we're doing them online now and i figured i'd open it up to my friends and everyone i know so feel free to share these videos they'll be posted after the live session as well They'll remain up on YouTube, so feel free to share them. Um, the purpose is to get the information out. The first lecture is already posted. Um, it was live. I'm thinking about also going through it and actually recording that again and posting it because I had technical difficulties there and wasn't able to post the PowerPoint or play the PowerPoint while I was presenting. But... Um, Anyway, the purpose of these videos is uh, sort of twofold. One, since it is, we are affected by this pandemic, um, 
we know that it's important for us to have good immune function and these things that I'm going to be sharing with you improve the function of your immune system and so that will help you to better um, be able to fight off infection. Also, um, as I mentioned in the first lecture, we have a, another pandemic that we're facing of obesity and uh, and of course, these tips will help with, with weight loss. Now, you can be a healthy weight and still be unhealthy. Uh, you can have an unhealthy diet, you cannot exercise and uh, things like this. So uh, these principles are helpful for all of us regardless of our weight. Um, um, but uh, we can tell from the research that lifestyle issues play a role in the development of chronic disease. Um, so, um, and I should also mention that you do want to, before you start any lifestyle change program, you want to talk to your doctor. One of the things, for instance, I mentioned in the first lecture was drinking lots of water. Uh, you want to, um, if you have kidney issues, uh, that's something you might, or you have maybe heart failure, that's something you need to talk about with your doctor. And if you're on a warfarin, for instance, if you eat a lot of leafy greens, um, and which has a lot of vitamin K, that can affect your blood clotting. And so you need to talk to your doctor about that as those kind of things. And that's why it's important and why we say you need to talk to your doctor before you do change, make changes like this. They can be very effective. You just need to um, discuss with, and work with your doctor as you, as you make the changes in your life. <clears throat> Okay, so let's finally get started here. Um, so let's review from last time. I already mentioned the water. You want to drink plenty of water, as we saw. You can even, uh, by drinking more water, it can lead to weight loss even. Um, and so the functions of water, the benefits of water are, there's a lot of them. Um, of course, you want to limit the added sugar. We saw that uh, Americans are eating about a, on average 100 pounds of sugar per year and one of the major sources of added sugar of course was soda so we said um, we discussed um, trying to limit those things and of course when I talk about changes in your lifestyle I never really like to say you need to you can't do this or you can't do that there are certain things of course you can't do but you shouldn't do but um, I always like to say that you should replace, if you're going to eliminate something, if you're going to eliminate added sugar, you should replace it with something else. Sugar literally um, has addictive properties. Um, that's been seen, shown in animals. It's the same pathway as, for instance, like drug addiction, like cocaine in your brain. But uh, you want to, um, you're going to need to replace that with something better. Otherwise, you're going to have kind of have this empty um space that you'll fill with some other addiction maybe. And so some helpful things for that, if you start to eat less sugar, uh, dates. Dates are very, um, although yeah, they're higher in sugar content, they also have a lot of fiber. So therefore the glycemic index um, isn't that high. We'll talk more about glycemic index, but um, it uh, won't spike your blood sugar. In other words, like a uh, candy bar would or, or just straight candy. Uh, or soda, for instance. So lemon added sugar, um, if you do that, try to replace it with other um, maybe sweeter things like fruit, um, healthier options. Um, now fruit juice will have the same effect on your blood sugar basically as would um, sodas in some instances um, because the fiber is not there. So you're just eating, you're drinking a lot of sugar without the whole, it's not the whole food. And so that's why I stress whole foods. Um, one of the reasons that I stress whole food. Um, also eat more fiber. There's a plethora of benefits from eating fiber uh, as we discussed last time. And um, by doing that, you can lose weight, prevent cancers, um, and uh, a whole slew of other benefits. If you wanted to see, you could see the first video. And then eat your breakfast. Of course, we saw those two groups, the one that ate the big breakfast uh, and the small dinner versus the group that ate the smaller breakfast and the big dinner. Uh, they compared the two groups. They had the same amount of calorie consumption in the day, but the group that ate a bigger breakfast and a smaller dinner had um, 
more weight loss, they, their triglycerides went down, whereas the other group, their triglycerides actually went up. Um, this group, the, the, their waist circumference went down, um, and their hunger hormone, ghrelin, um, also was down. So those are some helpful tips and that you can try to apply from the last lecture. I hope you made some goals and hopefully you were able to meet them. Um, and uh, if you were, comment um, and, or um, type it in the chat. Just let me know because that would be encouraging for me if you applied something and it worked for you. I know Raelle uh, said um, in a previous chat, she said that uh, from the first lecture she ate um, more for breakfast or she maybe had an apple for breakfast, I think, and uh, she wasn't as hungry during the day. So things like that are helpful to share. So today we are going to talk for one about fad diets, particularly I'm going to address low carb diets. We're going to talk about principles, dietary principles for optimal health. We're going to talk about reading labels. So um, first of all, let's talk uh, I have a timeline here that I found online that I think was 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 really interesting. Um, just listing kind of the succession of different diets, and they all have kind of this one thing in common, that being that they're low carb. Um, first of all, there's the cabbage soup diet. I just found this one humorous um, in a way because basically, literally, all you do is eat all the cabbage soup you want. And I guess they can put different vegetables in. I'm not sure what the rules are exactly, but and people still do this now. Um, if you look online, uh, you can find different people that do this. And of course you're going to lose weight if you're just eating cabbage soup all the time. You probably won't get all the nutrients you need, uh, in my opinion, but I just found this one humorous uh, a little bit. Um, next one is the Paleolithic nutrition. Um, and there's different uh, versions of kind of the Paleo um, philosophy in diets um, throughout the years, I guess. Uh, as of 2002, it's on this timeline. Um, and, you know, of course, there's other diets out there, but this was just a timeline that I found of low carb diets. Um, the paleo diet, <clears throat> basically, uh, the idea is it's sort of a hunter or gatherer diet. And um, so, Kind of going back to the principles of what this, what uh, they believe this diet was like, uh, being that it would be before kind of the agricultural revolution, before you know when there was a lot of agriculture and things like that, is what the thought was, where they were they're eating less refined carbohydrates and lower sodium, but yet they were higher in fiber and protein, and I guess the diets are comparable in the amount of fat and cholesterol of the average diet today. And then of course they are more physically active being hunters and gatherers. Um, the diet is uh, consists of lean meats, fish, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, um, and limits the foods like I said from farming like dairy, legumes, grains, and other processed foods. And um, So um, the uh, interesting thing is, is that a lot of people say, you know, this is what our ancestors ate, but an interesting YouTube video, there's an anthrop anthropologist, uh, she went to Harvard, uh, and she uh, has a video about kind of debunking this paleo myth, um, that this is the way that we ate. She's saying that we are basically the way that we are, um, and you look at our dentition and, and other factors, uh, we're actually more suited for eating a omnivorous sort of diet. Um, and uh, so just, uh, just interesting information. So moving on, um, we see Dr. Atkins, the Atkins Revolution. This is 1992, of course. He had developed some principles uh, earlier on than that. And from what I understand, this diet, the original Atkins kind of plan included two weeks of induction, basically an induction phase where you ate 20 grams of carbohydrates per day 
slowly increasing that to five grams of carbs, or slowly increasing that by five grams of carbs per week, and then stopping that increase when you get to 40 to 90 grams, kind of holding that steady. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this diet, of course, is lower carb. Currently, the plans that I saw on their website are labeled as Atkins 20, Atkins 40, or Atkins 100, basically different levels of low carb, the, the number indicating how many grams per day, um, the way I understand it. And of course, he says on the website, this is the original keto diet, which was 20 grams of carbs per day. Um, and uh, so that's the idea behind that. And the whole idea behind sort of this low carb diet, keto diet, I um, philosophy is sort of that you're putting your, your body into a ketotic state um, where it's producing ketone bodies, uh, which happens during a fasting state. And what that does is you're mobilizing more fat for fuel. And in the short term, people do, and there are studies that show that people do lose weight. Now, weight loss, though, is that the only outcome of importance is the question. Because, um, you know, I can starve myself and lose weight. Um, but is it the best thing to, for me to do for my health um, is another question. And is it sustainable long term? That's the other question. Um, if you're going to be feeling, you know, kind of hangry all the time, if you know what that term means, if you ever felt uh, hangry before, um, if you can feel that way all the time, um, you know, that's basically what, you know, you're, you're kind of doing in a way. Um, and, but, um, the, the, but, you know, part of the keto diet is, um, a lot of people are incorporating intermittent fasting as well. And that also does put your body in the a ketotic state. Um, you're mobilizing more fat for fuel and for energy as your energy source and also your muscle tissue too, as well, possibly. Um, and, uh, but a lot of people will do the fast um, and they'll skip breakfast. Um, at least some people that I've talked to, that's what they do. And if you're going to do the intermittent fasting, actually it'd be better for your health um, to do the fast at night. So maybe you have a bigger breakfast, eat lunch, and get all your, your calories in by maybe 2 p.m. and then do the fast. Um, and uh, you know this can have, this can have potentially health benefits. Um, so, uh, moving on the zone diet, um, Dr. Barry Spears, uh, Sears, sorry, uh, I I guess I understand. He says that there's a physiological state when your body can optimally perform and control inflammation, and he advertises a third of your plate being lean protein, two thirds being carbohydrates, and one third being fat. Then we have the South Beach diet, which was Dr. Arthur Agatson. Uh, on the website, this is a direct quote from the website, a keto-friendly meal plan designed to follow the basic principles of keto, low carb, high fat, but with greater flexibility. So there's four weeks and one week plans that you can buy on the website. And of course, all of these sites are trying to sell something um, to get you to buy their product. And um, so yeah, we, we go on and there's 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 lot there's others as well. I'm not this is no extensive review of fad diets, but those were some um, fad diets that I saw. And this timeline goes on and shows that um, uh, there was there's ongoing popularity of low carb diets, and also there was in 2018 this study called Diet Fits, which basically showed no significant difference in weight loss when a low carb diet was compared to a high fat diet. But I'm going to share with you just some truth um, about low carb diets from the evidence. And uh, you will find, like I said, studies out there that show weight loss and improvement in, in no, some numbers of low carb diets. Um, some of the ones tend to be kind of shorter term follow up um, that I've seen. But looking at large scale studies, um, basically the trend is that there's increased risk of alter all cause mortality with low carb diets. 
And the assumption is um, that this is due to increased meat consumption in, because that's what tends to replace um, your, um, your, if you're eating uh, less of your total caloric intake from carbohydrates, then you're going to need to replace that with protein and fat, uh, which is the idea. And so when you do that, most of the, t com most commonly, those sources would be <clears throat> meat, um, which are higher in fat and higher in protein. <clears throat> and so, um, and you know, I, I've known people that have gone on these low carb diets, the Atkins, for instance, my grandpa would go on that on and off every once in a while and he would lose weight short term, but then he'd gain it back. Um, but it consisted mostly of high fat, like bacon and greasy foods, hamburgers, and you take the bun off and you eat the hamburger and this kind of thing. Now, if you look at the websites, it looks like they've kind of mellowed out with that because um, they realize that it's not good for your health, um, for one. But um, you can see on the websites they're incorporating more vegetables and other things that are um, lower carb. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thought is that it's due to increased meat consumption because the um, <clears throat> uh, World Health Organization has come out with a statement saying that processed meat, meaning hot dogs, deli meats, things like that, is a known carcinogen to humans. And they also say that red meat is probably carcinogenic to humans. So this is a big deal. I mean, something that's known, carcinogen means it causes cancer. So processed meat is known to cause cancer. It just does cause cancer in humans. And red meat probably does. So this is kind of a big deal. Um, they also said that each 50 gram portion of processed meat eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18. So, um, animal-based foods tend to increase heart disease risk. So looking at a, um, this plot was a, the results of a large-scale meta-analysis um, that was published in the Lancet, in Lancet Public Health, demonstrating that um, when you look at low-carb diets, if you look at the trend, um, basically they there was a study published called PURE. Um, I forget what it stands for, but basically it looked at multiple areas, multiple locations uh, in different continents, and they analyzed the um, carbohydrate consumption, and they found that the results were that higher carbohydrate diets increase mortality. Now, this study was in response to that. It was a large-scale meta-analysis and prospective cohort. So they looked also and did their own study um, and they looked at um, um, a large cohort and they analyzed them on a continual scale. So they looked at carbohydrate intake um, um, as percent of energy from carbohydrates uh, of total caloric intake. And what they found was um, a U-shaped relationship. And basically what I call there's a sweet spot. So basically that being 50 to 55 percent of carbohydrates from um, your total caloric intake, getting 50 to 55 percent is where you have the lowest risk of mortality. But yes, they did find if you have high carbohydrate diet, um, you would have a higher risk of mortality. If you had a lower, if you were consuming a lower amount of energy from carbohydrates, you also had higher mortality. Now, if you look at this graph, you can tell that actually the, the risk, and this on the y-axis is hazard ratio, basically the chance of death compared to um, uh, the control. And so when you look and you see, you can find that the slope is much greater on the lower carbohydrate side and the hazard ratio or the risk of mortality is much higher compared to the higher carbohydrate side. What the results found was that, like I said, minimal risk is 50 to 55 percent of your energy from carbohydrate. And when you have less than 40 percent, you have an increased risk of mortality and a shorter residual lifespan, meaning 
the amount of years left that you have to live. Um, and the thought was that this is due to the increased inflammatory biological aging effects and oxidative stress associated with low carb diets. When you're looking at the greater than 70%, um, there is a greater than 70% of energy from carbohydrates, there's an increased mortality as well and shorter residual lifespan. And the thought was that this is <clears throat> when you have the population that has this higher carbohydrate intake is they're primarily, get, primarily getting their carbohydrates from refined carbohydrate sources. Um, <clears throat> but there's one exception to this rule, and that was that if you have, if you do consume a low carbohydrate diet, they showed that if you replace the animal based sources of protein with plant based sources of protein with that lower carbohydrate diet, protein and fat sources, um, if they're plant based, you actually have lower mortality. Um, so if you're going to do a low carb diet, make it plant based is <clears throat> the moral of the story um, with this particular result. Now, um, there are actually benefits of keto diets. Um, like I said, there's short term weight loss. However, here it's showing that the risk of mortality is increased. But there is evidence to show that low carb diets are helpful for um, those with epilepsy um, because um, the blood, the mechanism, I guess, is not entirely clear. But the thought is that it can help prevent seizures. Um, in epileptic um, patients. So if you want to, if you have epilepsy, then a ketogenic diet might be helpful in that case. And if you're going to do that, you want to reduce your mortality. So I would recommend making it a plant-based keto diet, um, meaning that you're getting your protein and fats from plant-based sources, not um, eggs, milk, cheese, you know, meat, um, these kind of things. So um, next slide here is showing results from the um, global uh, burden of disease. Let me move my screen out of the way here so you can see. Okay. Um, so looking here, this basically is global burden of disease looks at multiple countries um, and they look at risk factors for different types of diseases. And um, this is from public. This was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2018. And basically, they looked at data from the global burden of disease um, data. They looked at specifically the United States. And what they showed is that dietary risks is a risk factor for the greatest number of deaths in 2016 out of all these other factors, even higher than tobacco use. I think that is very profound. And also, <clears throat> it's higher. See, low physical activity we know is a, a um, has a big impact on health, but look how low physical activity is on this chart. And this is just one component. I'm not saying that physical activity is not important, and we'll have another lecture on that, actually. That'll be our next lecture. Um, but um, this is showing this profound risk, and this um, percentage of that here, this, this light blue, was 83.9% of that is cardiovascular disease. The rest is basically cancer, diabetes, and other diagnoses. Um, <clears throat> so this is, in one year, 529,000, over 529,000 deaths related to dietary risk factors, according to these results. Um, and uh, here we have, um, I just want to double check something here, make sure that I have this right.
Yeah, okay. So um, when you look at this next chart, this chart is actually showing the years of life. It's called disability adjusted life years, which is a the sum of years lost, years of life lost, plus the years lived with disability. So this is showing that due to um, dietary risk factors, again, looking at this, it wasn't as high as tobacco in this case, disability adjusted life years. So 11% of life um, lived in dis with disability adjusted, um, well, that's probably not the right way to word it, but basically it's a combination of, like I said, years of life lost plus years of life with the disability. Um, and 11% of the lifespan um, would be disability adjusted life years um, due to dietary risk factors. And what were these factors that they define, you might be asking, as dietary risks? And it's really simple, actually. For the most part, it has to do with fruit and whole grain consumption. That was, um, according to the parameters they looked at, the factors that contributed most were underconsumption of whole grains and underconsumption of fruits even more than under consumption of vegetables. So, and then, uh, and then, so under consumption of fruits and whole grains and over consumption of sodium and processed meat was what contributed to those dietary risk factors according to this data. So uh, let's transition and talk a little bit more um, about this subject. Uh, by focusing on the world's longest living people, our blue zones. National Geographic teamed up with some others and they looked, they set out to find kind of the longest, the, the geographical regions where they had the longest living people and what were the characteristics of these people. One of the locations they looked at and found was um, Icaria, Greece. Uh, and uh, this is off the coast of Turkey and it has some of the world's lowest rates of middle-aged mortality and dementia. And research links their increased longevity with their traditional Mediterranean diet, which is what? Heavy in vegetables and healthy fats and contains smaller amounts of dairy and meat products. What do you know? Uh, then you look at Okinawa, Japan, which is um, uh, home to the world's longest lived women. Uh, food staples like Okinawan sweet potatoes, soybeans, mugwort, turmeric, and goya or bitter melon. If you ever had, I've had bitter melon before um, when I was in Guam actually, and um, it's pretty bitter, you know, but it's touted to have really um, a lot of health benefits. Uh, here is uh, Sardinia and uh, has the highest concentration of centenarian men. That's men that live over 100. This population consumes a low protein diet. Uh, there it is, low protein diet associated with lower rates of diabetes, cancer, and death for people under age 65. Then we have our very own um, in the United States, Loma Linda, California. It has the highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists in the United States and some residents live 10 more healthy years than the average American by following a biblical diet of grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Um, and um, I do happen to be a Seventh-day Adventist actually, um, and I do follow a plant-based diet, but um, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, as we'll see, there's actually a study we're going to look at, looking at Seventh-day Adventists. Um, they don't all follow the, the plant-based diet. It's not necessarily um, a, uh, something that all of them, all of us practice. Um, however, um, it is based on uh, the biblical diet of grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Um, but primarily the reason is taking care of our health is important um, based on the principle that body, mind, and spirit are all connected. And also that um, um, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we should take care of our, 
our bodies so that we can have a clear mind and so that we can have a closer relationship with God. That's the that's the principle there. Um, another place is Costa Rica, and um, here in um, Nicoya Peninsula, there is residents that have the lowest rate of middle age mortality and the second highest concentration of male centenarians. Their longevity secret lies partly in their strong faith communities, deep social network, and habits of regular low intensity physical activity. So uh, here, here are the principles that they outline on this Blue Zone website of, in general, what is it that these people are doing? Um, that, uh, you know, their lifestyle characteristics, in other words. So let's look here at what those are. One is they retreat from meat. Centenarians eat about two ounces or less, um, about five times per month. They reduce dairy. And then weekly, they consume 28 grams of added sugars daily. Um, that's seven teaspoons of added sugar daily. So um, it's a lot less than Americans. I think, if I remember correctly, we said that um, the average American is consuming like 34 teaspoons. Um, so that's significantly more. And I'm just going to confirm that that is the case. Really quick here. Because I don't want to give you the wrong information. Yeah, 34 teaspoons per day, according to the, um, the USDA, is the average consumption of added sugar for Americans. That would be compared to the um, blue zones, which are average, on average are consuming only seven teaspoons of added sugar per day. So they even do have still added sugar, it's just that they're eating much less than we are. Um, they're eliminating eggs, um, no more than three eggs per week. And I think that's actually consistent with what the research is showing, too, um, as far as health risks of eggs go. Um, so you want to eliminate eggs and go easy on flesh, fewer than three ounces, up to three times a week. Um, and uh, they snack on nuts, one to two handfuls per day. They drink mostly water, seven glasses per day, coffee, tea, wine, in moderation. Um, and so they have a daily dose of beans, about one cup per day, and I definitely recommend that as well. Beans are high in fiber, antioxidants, protein, um, vitamins, minerals. Beans are a power food, any kind of bean. Uh, you want to get plenty of beans in your, in your diet. And um, uh, Alex last time had asked about what's the best bean you can eat. And really, all the beans are going to have different benefits. Um, but if you've heard of... Um, Dr. Greger, he has videos um, about nutrition, evidence-based nutrition, and uh, he goes through and he talks about <clears throat> from the research benefits of different types of beans, so that might be something you would like to watch if you want. I can send a link, just let me know. Um, and then you want to go wholey whole. So again, whole, unprocessed, as much as possible. And they are 95 to 100 percent plant-based. So um, I kind of said these like they were recommendations, but um, <clears throat> they aren't necessarily recommendations as much as they are just got, they are just our um, characteristics of what these people are doing. So let's look at the um, Adventist Health Study. And this is what I was mentioning before. Um, this is results from the Adventist Health Study 2, I believe. Um, there were two done, and there's been research published from the results. Basically, they looked at Seventh-day Adventist dietary patterns, and they found that vegetarian diets are associated with lower BMI, lower prevalence and incidence of diabetes mellitus, lower prevalence of metabolic syndrome and its component factors, 
lower prevalence of hypertension, lower all-cause mortality, and in some instances, lower risk of cancer. So the Seventh-day Adventists are an interesting group of people to um, research because you can get different types of diet within that group. So you can get people that are eating meat, you can get people that are lacto ovo vegetarian, those that are semi-vegetarian, they sometimes eat meat, pesco vegetarian, meaning they eat fish sometimes, um, and then completely plant-based, meaning they don't eat any animal products at all. No dairy, eggs, um, meat, fish, any of that. So you can look at the differences between these people, and I think the study population was like 90,000 people, so it was a big study population, and it included, um, which previous studies had not, from what I understand, it had included um, a, a good population, a good sized population of African Americans and also Jamaican Americans. Um, so it was useful to see that. And this was a study published in Nutrients showing results of the Adventist Health Study, breaking it down by type of diet. And they showed there's a stepwise decrease the more plant based you get in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So the non-vegetarian having the highest percentage um, of diabetes in this population versus the vegan or completely plant-based um, individual having the lowest prevalence. Also long-term results of meat consumption in a basically a subpopulation showed that there's a 74% increase in developing diabetes 17 years after. So if someone in this study didn't have diabetes and then was followed for 17 years, they had a 74% increase in developing diabetes if they consumed meat. That's a big increased risk. So this is kind of where we left off last time where the video got cut off. Um, basically, um, I was going to show a video demonstrating because a lot of people you know, there's kind of the idea that, well, sugar intake, you know, I've got diabetes, I need to watch my sugar intake, I got to watch my carbohydrate intake. But I will say there's actually doctors, Dr. McDougall, for instance, um, I believe is in California, and he is actually reversing diabetes with a starch based diet. So they're eating lots of vegetables, lots of potatoes, different things like this, no meats, no dairy, um, no eggs, and they're actually getting off of their medications. And of course, they're monitored and they, I'm sure they're in an exercise program and other things. But um, so this kind of is a sort of a difference in, in thought about diabetes. And the factors that are thought to lead to what's called insulin resistance, which um, leads to type 2. Now, this is different than type 1 diabetes. So there's different types of diabetes. Type 1 would be an autoimmune attack on the beta cells in your pancreas, which are the cells that produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes would be that your beta cells are still producing insulin, but the <clears throat> cells in the rest of your body are not able to respond to that insulin to take up the glucose into the cells. And so glucose accumulates in your bloodstream, leading to higher blood sugars. The thought behind, one of the thoughts, there's there actually are a lot of um, potential mechanisms for the causes of insulin resistance, but one of them is saturated fat intake and the amount of what's called intramyocellular lipids, which would be fat accumulation in your muscle cells. Um, and the idea is that it's kind of preventing the, it's kind of causing, having a role in causing this insulin resistance. And so by um, essentially decreasing saturated fat intake, you can um, actually reverse it. Now, if you have type 2 diabetes long term, um, you know, 10 years plus, it may be more difficult because you may actually start doing damage to the beta cells in your pancreas. Um, but um, uh, it's still worth uh, attempting to to um, at least um, uh, at least uh, help your diabetes and um, assist in managing your diabetes, but also there's potential for um, you know getting off some of your medications as well. And uh, Dr. Greger um, 
has a video and I have a link in there to that video. Um, and uh, I can post this PowerPoint as well if you'd like. Again, like I posted the other one, so you can actually just click on the link or I can put that link in the chat for you. So this is a chart that um, someone I did a clinical rotation with, Dr. Drozik. He used to be a surgeon, but now he is a life uh, lifestyle medicine practitioner. And uh, he has this, he kind of uses this chart in his presentation showing that there's sort of this continuum. If you want to get better in your health, just aim for more plant-based foods. In your, and this is in regard to diet. So obviously there's other components of health than just diet. I know I'm, I'm harping on diet in these first two lectures um, a lot. I'm talking about diet a lot. But there's other factors besides just diet um, that has to do with your health. There's, you know, this is a component of physical health. Exercise would be another component of physical health. But of course, there's also mental, emotional, and spiritual health. We're going to address all of those things in the lectures. Next time we're going to address um, the um, physical activity component. Um, but right now, <clears throat> we're just talking about nutrition, which is actually, as we saw, a big component of your health that has a big impact on your physical health in particular. <clears throat> but, um, see, you just want to aim towards more plant-based foods. So that doesn't necessarily mean even cutting things out. Like I mentioned last time, you need to, it, um, most Americans are not consuming enough fiber. Fiber fills you up and helps you to stay full longer. And so if you just start off by eating, don't change anything that you're eating if you wanted to start off small and just start eating an apple or fruits and vegetables before you eat fresh fruits and vegetables that are whole before you eat your regular meal. Then you'll actually start filling up, you'll notice, on those other types of foods first, and then you'll be less likely to overeat on the less healthy, fattier, greasier, higher um, in saturated fat and salt and oil type foods. So let's talk and do a little demonstration. This will be fun. Um, we'll just talk about how to read labels. There's five steps. Um, and we'll just go ahead and look at the, Now these steps are based on um, Jeff Novick's, um, he, he, Jeff Novick's kind of guidelines. He's a dietitian, and he's outlined some methods for reading labels. And I have it at the end of the um, document, or I mean PowerPoint. And I can also send it to you if you'd like. Um, or even better yet, I'm, I have a link to Dr. Drozik's lifestyle um, medicine clinic at the end of this presentation. If you go there, you can actually see even more presentations, videos, and a load of resources downloads, um, handouts, helpful tools to help you um, to make changes. And in there, you'll see the information that I'm sharing with you now about reading labels. So reading labels, let's talk first. You're going to want to look at the total fat. The first thing you do when you look at the label, look at the total fat. You want it to be 20% or less of total calories, and you want it to have no unhealthy fats, which would be trans fats or saturated fat. Um, that would be 1B, looking at unhealthy fats. Um, then you look at, secondly, you look at sodium. It should be, um, you know, you don't technically need, I think you only need physiologically about 250 milligrams of sodium. And this of course varies depending on how much you sweat, depending on how active you are. But in general, an average about 250 milligrams of sodium is all we need to be for physiologic function. Um, but um, and just in general, we are eating way more than, the, than that. And so if you try to keep your sodium intake equal to the amount of total calories in that food item that you're looking at, then that should be okay. 
Then you're going to want to read the ingredients. Then you're going to want to look at sugar intake. Um, and you want there to be minimally added sugars. Should be less than 5% of calories. And um, you look at fiber. So you want your fiber to, you want your <clears throat> ingredients to say whole grains. And also you want to look at the ratio of carbohydrates to fiber. And you want that to be less than five. And so tech, um, most of the time, the foods that are whole grains will be lower than five, but the refined foods will be the ones that have a lot of, um, uh, will have a, a ratio that's greater than five because there's not as much fiber. So um, let's get started. Now, again, I want to say that, of course, when you go to the grocery store, it actually makes it a lot easier if you buy the foods that are don't have labels because if you chop sort of at the in the produce aisle and get most of your foods there most of those foods have no labels on them and that mean in in general that's usually better because those foods um you know you don't need to worry about what the label says for the most part um because they're the whole plant-based foods and you can eat those um sort of you know freely without really thinking much about that. Let me move my, whoops, not that. I want to I want to move my face out of the way. Let me move it down here and see if that is good. So, Skippy peanut butter. So what are we going to do first? We're going to look at the fat, right? So there are 190 calories total. And on this label, it tells you how many calories come from fat. So we can look at the total fat and we would find the percentage. 74% is fat. So what did we want it to be? We wanted it to be no more than 20% of calories from fat. So that's too high. Now let's look at the natural um, Skippy peanut butter. That would be better, right? Actually, it's the same exact thing with as far as fat goes, 74%. So it's it's way over, um, and that's going to be the case with any nut butter. It doesn't mean you can't. Um, well, well, we'll talk about that more when we look at the ingredients of these in particular. Okay, what do we do next? We're going to look at the type of fat, see if there's unhealthy fats. Of course, there's three grams saturated fat. We don't like that, um, and usually saturated fat is normally only in, um, it's only going to be in <clears throat> animal foods primarily. However, there is um, some amount in nuts, and, it, and uh, it's thought that more kind of fat is, is um, um, <clears throat> kind of able to be digested when it's, when it's um, made into a nut butter. Um, so, um, there is some saturated fat in this, but we'll also see why that is in a minute. Is there any trans fat? Well, um, the interesting thing about that is that there is. It says there's zero, right? But the FDA allows you to say, allows um, um, food manufacturers to say zero when there's less than 0.5 grams of trans fat. And the reason that this is significant is because that's in one serving. So if you have two servings of this, you're technically getting one gram of trans fat. And any amount of trans fat probably isn't healthy because it's um, it's not good for health and may cause cancer. It's kind of a, a um, man-made fat. And the reason is because it kind of increases shelf life and it's also solid at room temperature, so it won't melt. Um, at room temperature. So that's helpful in, in making food. There is no cholesterol, so that's a good thing. Let's look at the natural. There's actually more saturated fat in this one, but there is no trans fat for real, and there's no cholesterol. And we'll see why in a minute, because the next thing we're going to do, well, actually, after we look at sodium, so this one would be okay. The sodium is less than the amount of calories. Um, same with this one, the natural. Let's look at the ingredients. So here we see 
culprit for why there actually is. You have to look at the ingredients because you wouldn't have seen, you, you would have seen that there's zero trans fat, but this is the, um, this is what would tip you off to show you that there actually is trans fat in it. Hydrogenated vegetable oil, that is trans fat. So you want to avoid that. Now let's look at the natural. There's less ingredients and there's no trans fat, which is better. Um, and the way that they get away from that but with this is that they use something called palm oil. Now the palm oil is what would <clears throat> actually um, help it to be solid at room temperature, but also that's why there was more saturated fat in the natural creamy peanut butter because Palm oil actually is one of the few plant sources of saturated fat. So you want to try to avoid that because that can raise your cholesterol. So let's look at um, sugar. That's the next thing we need to look at. And when we look at sugar, we see that in um, <clears throat> added sugar. So we saw in the ingredients they added sugar, and there's three grams of sugar, which is not a good thing. We don't like the added sugar. Um, we want to try to avoid that. And 6% of calories is from sugar, and we wanted it to be less than 5. So that's a bad thing. And when we look at the natural, it's the same thing. We go back and we look next at carbohydrate to fiber ratio. And we see 6 divided by 2 is 3, so that's okay. And... 6 divided by 2 is 3 for the natural as well. So that would be okay because you want that to be less than or equal to 5. Let's skip this one. Um, this one's not terrible. It's a little high in fat. But um, otherwise it's okay. But I want to look at something probably more commonly consumed, which is Nature Valley Crunch Granola Bars. How many of you have cons have have you have had these before? Um, let's look at Nature Valley. So, what are we going to look at first? Fat, right? And what are the um, calories from fat. So we have to figure it out in this one. It's not telling us the calories from fat, so we have to calculate it. And the amount of calories per gram fat is nine. So what that means is that you're going to multiply seven by nine. This is two bars. Of course, nobody's gonna eat one bar. Well, maybe some people do, I don't know. But most people, I would say, probably are gonna eat both bars. I mean, they package two bars in a single package, so um, I think most people are going to eat both bars. Um, so let's calculate the fat, and you have 63 divided by 190, because you 7 times 9 is 63, and you get 33%. Who would have thought the Nature Valley is too high in fat? You want that to be less than 20, and it's 33%. What's next? You look at the type of fat, and you see that there is saturated fat, there's no trans fat, for real. Um, there's no cholesterol. Now we look at sodium. You see that the sodium's okay because you look at calories compared to sodium, and it's okay. Now let's look at the ingredients. You don't want sugar to be in the first three ingredients because ingredients are listed by weight. And if it's in the first three, that's a no-no. Um, so you want to try to avoid foods that have that. It does have whole grains in it, which is good, and they'll definitely be advertising that. Um, but you'll notice there's multiple types of sugar kind of hidden. It does say sugar straight out, but there's also honey, brown sugar syrup, and uh, so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of sugar in, in these. And they add the canola oil, so that's where the fat extra fat comes from. Okay, what's next? What are we going to look at next? We're going to look at the um, sodium, right? 
oh, I'm sorry, we already looked at sodium. We're going to look at the fat content next. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. We're going to look at the sugar content next. So uh, in, the, in the carbohydrate to fiber ratio. So uh, we see that there's 11 grams of added sugar. And that's not very good. Um, because added sugar, we want it to be five grams or less. We want it to be, um, you know, less than five grams. And you want it to be um, really less than 5% of calories. And in this case, it's 23% of your total calories. And the carbohydrate to fiber ratio is 29 divided by 2. 14.5. That's because there's so much added sugar. There's not as much, even though it did use whole grains, um, it, it, um, the added sugar kind of overrides that. You want this ratio to be, what, less than 5, right? And it's 14.5. Then we look at these chili cheese Fritos. We look at the fat content first. 90 calories from fat. So we do 90 divided by 160. And that's 56%. Um, you want that less than 20, and it's 56. Okay, so now what? Look at sodium, right? Or I mean the fat type and then sodium. So uh, this does have saturated fat, 1.5 grams. It does, doesn't have trans fat, for real. Um, and it doesn't have any cholesterol, so that's good. But still, it's got that saturated fat in it. Now we look at sodium, right? And we compare it to calories, and it's too much. We have 270 compared to 160. And now we look at the ingredients. Oh, no. Um, there's a lot of different things in here. You might not know what some of those things are. Disodium inosinate, um, disodium guanylate. Um, and then you have all of these different things. And of course, salt is the third ingredient on this one. Um, and uh, a lot of fat content in the chips. Of course, fat equals flavor. And that's what salt and fatty foods are going to, you know, if you have a lot of salt and fat, you're going to buy more of it and eat more of it. But remember, it's not going to fill you up that well um, as much as a higher fiber food would. Be, would. Um, so now we look at the what? So there's one gram of added sugar, and that comes out to be minimally added sugar. So that's one good thing. Um, it's total less than 5% of calories, um, so that's good. Now let's look at the carbohydrate to fiber ratio, 15 to 1, so that's 15. <laughs> you want it to be less than 5, right? So that's not good. Okay, special K, fruit and yogurt. Let's look at this one. And we'll just look at the straight cereal and the total fat. It's um, nine. So there's one gram of fat. So you divide. So there's nine calories per gram, right? So nine calories divided by 160 times 100 is 5.6 percent. So that's less than 20. That's definitely low. And they know they're targeting people that are trying to go lower fat too. So that's why they. Make it low fat, probably. <clears throat> um, also, there is a little bit of saturated fat, though, in it. Um, there's no trans fat and there's no cholesterol. And we look next at sodium. And we have 190 compared to 160. So it's got a lot of sodium, actually, in it. And then we look at the ingredients. There's a whole bunch of ingredients and sugar. Here we are, is the third ingredient. Probably not good. Um, corn syrup is another type of sugar. Brown sugar syrup. Um, uh, tocopherols is just vitamin E, basically. Molasses is another type of su uh, sugar. Um, and then BHT is a preservative. So we see that. And then they add vitamins here. So now what are we going to look at? After we look at the ingredients, we're going to look at the sugar, right? 
and there's see this on this label it shows you how much is actually added sugar so wow 11 grams of added sugar um, there's foods that are actually a lot higher than that in all fairness and cereals are usually a lot higher as well this is actually not that much for a cereal relatively speaking uh, but it's still added sugar and it's still 22 percent of the calories so it's hard to find a good a good cereal that fits in this criteria um, so now we're going to look at the carbohydrate fiber ratio 36 to 3 12 so it's not less than 5 either um, which is kind of surprising but um, probably because of all the added sugar it kicks up that carbohydrate compared to the fiber oh let's look at mac and cheese so calories from fat we'll look at um, um, this here as as prepared here um, and so we see that there's 31 percent from fat calories from fat here and um, the unhealthy fats there's one and a half grams saturated fat and there's no trans fat but there's 10 grams of I'm sorry milligrams that should be of cholesterol the sodium is what is uh, kind of throws this way over 570 compared to how many calories 250 um, so it's way over more than double and then you probably don't even want to look at the ingredients um, I used to eat this all the time when I was a kid almost every day um, but uh, it's not so good there's a lot of um, you know there's preservatives there's um, it's not whole grain and um, it's just not that great um, they actually add there's uh, I'm sorry there's zero added sugar um, and uh, it's 2.4 percent of calories so it's okay in that regard um, when we look at the ratio carbohydrates to, to sugar it's 27 to or I mean carbohydrates to fiber sorry it's 23.5 so you want that to be less than five and it's way higher because it's refined right it's not whole grain okay so um, kind of wrapping up here I wanted to share with you a recipe that you can use um, and I made it actually it's Lebanese lentil soup and it's really tasty it's got you can add a lemon flavor you you add um, lemon to it and it gives it a good flavor with cilantro fl fresh cilantro it's really really tasty it might not look that good but it tastes really good because um, my of course when you make it it doesn't look like the picture there um, but uh, definitely recommend it and that's actually on the blue zone website they have recipes there that you can check out so this is also from Dr. Drozek. You can find it on his website. I have a, a link in the next uh, couple slides to his website. Um, and uh, you want to fill your plate with at least 75% of your plate with foods that are high in fiber and water. That way you fill up on those things first and you eat less of the other processed foods and uh, animal product foods. Uh, this is his recommendation for a plate. It's really simple, really. Um, and this kind of simplifies things. You just eat your vegetables, your fruits, your legumes on most of your plate, and then you eat a little bit of these other things. It makes it really simple. And here is Doc, um, uh, Jeff Novick's um, guides and guidelines for reading labels. So summary. Um, so my recommendations from this lecture are aim to be more plant-based. And if you're going to go low carb, make it plant-based. But in general, you're going to be more apt to sustain your diet and to lose weight and to have better health if you make most of your foods plant-based that are high in fiber and water and you make those changes. Start reading labels. When you go to the store, start reading and being conscious of the labels. Bring the printout with you so that you can remember all the things you need to look at. And then try a new plant-based recipe. Um, I have a link posted here, um, and also um, there's plenty of others to try. 
you know, I can share more of those too if you'd like. So set your goals. Make sure you set SMART goals. We talked about that last time. Um, and do it now. Write something down that you that hit you from the presentation. You don't just make small goals one at a time uh, to aim towards better health. Something you can do that would be helpful. Um, and here's a link to Dr. Drozik's website. And here's my references. And thank you so much. Don't forget to post your questions. Visit me on my uh, Facebook page to ask questions or leave a comment. Um, thanks again so much for supporting and coming out, guys. Take care. Bye.